One short remark for all speakers, please speak up for the listeners on the internet and all the records. So it's in your interest. The sound seems to be okay, but not that great. So yeah. speaking loud and clearly is always good anyway, I guess. Okay, but not great. Okay, we're good. So welcome everybody. So thank you for being here. So being here. Uh, so our first speaker today is Paul Schreiber, a man with more modalities in his pocket than any than any one of us. I'm going to reveal them all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the topic of all start is super homotopy theory. Yes, and echo red. I hope I get to some echo reds. Oh, sorry. No, that's okay. okay. Yeah, there's more than. Right. So um. If the sum is some motivation. So most of you maybe are concerned with the foundation of mathematics. We should also mankind should also be eventually concerned with foundations of physics. It's a bit way ahead now, but um, there's maybe some hope to actually make some real progress there. Let me just indicate that there's the usual path to go from one to the other, which is a convoluted detour. First of all, we introduce lots of stuff that allows us to do homotopy theory, which is what you guys thinking about. And then we introduce even more stuff built on that homotopy theory actually. <laughs> kind of secretly, there's not what most physics textbooks would admit, but that's really what, what we need. One of the Lagrange complexes control these are homological objects that control class and dynamics. The VBRC theory is all about doing H theory by homotopy theory and so forth. So there's a long detour that gets us from the foundations of, of logic say to the foundations of our existence in this world here. And and there's very few people I would claim who actually know how to tra traverse the, the full path here. This is a long path. But then, of course, the reason we are here is that there's these amazing, yeah, there's, there's these amazing shortcuts. So homotopy type theory has this promise at least, maybe it's not fully proved yet, but it has this promise at least to you know shortcut all of this long detour, just get us right there for homotopy theory. And kind of the what I would like to suggest is that. Point of mode, one point of mode hop is that it may provide a shortcut for that second step. So that's a long story, and I won't be able to, you know, to, to doubt this. I won't really fully justify it today, but, but that's maybe what I would advertise to give in mind for what this model stuff is about. And this also, incidentally, actually, I think maybe the origin of, of our being here, if I may claim that. So it was maybe six years ago, five years ago, that I was visiting Pittsburgh. At the other university, right? Pittsburgh has these two universities. Uh, my my long-term string theory physics collaborator, Hisham Sati, was over at the other university, so I kept being invited there. Was there regularly giving talks? And it wasn't that year. I forget what if it was before, or after. Right around that year, where hot became a thing, the IAS year or something. So I started to have have heard of it. I knew kind of it of it, but not really what it is. So I was giving a talk over at Simeon String Theory, and I explained how there was some complicated anomaly cancellation problem, which we um, found as an easier solution or can be constructed in the first place. If you think of your infinity tuples of smooth infinity groups, it could be the system of a joint infinity mode functors. So I was giving that talk. Some of you may have been there, or anyway. So one person who was there was Chris Kapulkin, but that time was based here. It was a, of course a lecturer, so he was aware of the recent developments, and he heard me say the words groupoid, topos, functors, and stuff, and he said, "Oh, that's I want to hear more about this." So he urged me after this talk. He said. Why don't you come over the next day to see him to here and give a talk to the type theory department, to the logic department? And I said, there's no way. You know, I haven't even heard of type theory until two weeks ago. What can I, I can't give a talk to you people. But he insisted. And then I said, okay, I can kind of, I can't give a, I can't, you know, tell you a result or anything, but I can give you an exercise. I'd say, look, I have this infinite tuples with these adjunctions and I know it's really good for, for doing lots of things in, 
I think that mathematical physics since you're claiming now you have the internal language of infinity to also go formalize this. I think that's roughly what I said. I think Steve, you were around, maybe somebody else here in that thing. And then, um, as is my habit, I also wrote this down on the internet, of course. And then Mike got, got in, and I think Mike was sort of the one who, who solved this exercise or this problem, or is in the problem. You know. This started uh, in the process of solving that, that problem. So, so that's maybe a story of this. Okay, many things to be said here. I won't say everything on these slides. I want to introduce something that may be boring to uh, those of you who have followed me just a little bit about the years, because it's just the same old thing that I'm going to say again now. But I think this is maybe an occasion to actually say it again, maybe just for the record, or, or maybe because some people haven't actually seen it. So I want to I want to set up a model. Actually, I, I want to speak type theory. Yeah, I'm going to set up an infinity topos that serves as the canonical or a pretty good model for what you want to do if you want to do super homotopy theory. Why would you even do super homotopy theory? Or what is it even? And it sounds esoteric, which is very super laden there. You know, as often math, the terminology that people introduce is really bad for the purpose. So this, you know, once I talk to math colleagues, you, know, you guys just say super, just you know, to show off. You just want to, you know, it just sounds better if you say everything is super. He really believed that, you know, he didn't. And, and um, so that's not the reason. The reason is really this, I think. Maybe there's again not enough time in this talk to really fully justify this, but maybe I can do it over. So there's, there's some basic principles of physics, maybe just two basic principles. One is the gauge principle, this was, right, so physicists is kind of this wrong to ever say, oh, I have an electromagnetic field here and another one here, and they're equal or not. It turns out that's just not the right question. You have to ask, there's a gauge transformation between them that witnesses their equality. And that's exactly, if you go to the bottom of it, that is exactly and completely just the principle of homotopy theory, actually, in the context of geometric homotopy theory, because the physicists actually do this smoothly. So the gauge principle, and then you know, in string theory, you have these higher gauge fields. <coughs> they have two gauge fields. <coughs> Suppose that they're actually equal in two different ways. But then it's still wrong to ask if these two different gauge transformations are equal or not, because they have high, what's called higher gauge transformations, because this is by ghosts of ghosts. So lots of terminology, but it all boils down to just doing homotopy theory. And then there's something, the Pauli exclusion principle. It, it's, it doesn't seem to be maybe on first sight on par with the gauge principle, but, but actually it's a foundational thing. It says, roughly right, that Fermion fields, what do Fermion fields mean in the same state somehow? And so you ask, well, what could that possibly mean? Turns out what that really means, it's a well-known thing in mathematical physics, even though many physicists maybe don't actually know this. This means that, that your phase spaces in any field theory of fermions, not supersymmetric necessarily, any field theory of fermions, like the one we live in, uh, is actually a, an object in super geometry. The, the fermionic fields are odd graded coordinate functions of these super phase spaces, and that's what implements the poly exclusion principle. Um, so, so that's why we're interested in this. And, and now I'm going to set up, I'm just going to set up a infinite topos without much further motivation that, that implements all this. And then my goal is to show that it has, yeah, it's what you just said, that it has more modalities on it than, than that it has many modalities on it. Okay, so, so now something very basic. And yeah, so I'll do, I'll do a party on the board, but maybe on request. So I'll, I'll show some things. And then we see how, how happy you are with it. So I want to, I want to consider a sequence of sides that sit inside each other and that are related to each other. First one is that of Cartesian spaces. I'll show it in a moment. Then I'll enhance it a bit to formal Cartesian spaces, formal in the sense of formal power series. This is also a very bad name. Formal really means infinitesimal. It's infinitesimally thick, that's more it's called formal. So super formal is just a you know, combination of bad terms, but that's what goes. So, um, so let's start with card space. So car space is supposed to be just the, the category whose objects, there's an object for every natural number, it's just the set, if you wish, r to the n, the n tuples of real numbers. And the morphisms are the, the functions between these sets that are infinitely often, arbitrarily often differential. So they're continuous, they're continuous differential, and so forth. Smooth functions. So if you know about smooth manifolds, please warn me that I shouldn't assume that. If you know about smooth manifolds, then it's just the full subcategory. Of letters with manifolds of those that happen to be Rns. And I'll equip this with a with a site or broadly pre topology actually, the site in, in the elephant sense. Um, just a, the good open cover. So these Rns are diffeomorphic to, to smooth balls. Anyway, so you can you can ask that you have one Rn and you cover it by mapping other Rns to it, and the cover set to be good if every finite non-empty intersection is again diffeomorphic with Rn. It's just a technical condition that just makes this 
distance of three seconds. So that's the side of Cartesian spaces. Mike briefly mentioned this in his talk. And uh, here's a fact that um, is what I call it one of the three magical facts of differential geometry. So differential geometry a priori is far different from algebraic geometry. But there's kind of three, at least maybe, three magic facts that, that say it's unexpectedly closer to um, algebraic geometry than you might have had a reason to hope. So one of these facts is this one. In mean, algebraic geometry, you're going to say, let's take the, the category of algebras over some field, op it, maybe finitely generated algebras, and then just declare that to be equal to the category of local model spaces, of fine schemes. So you, you declare that by, by fiat, you declare that your spaces should be so that homes of your spaces are faithfully reflected by algebra homomorphisms in the opposite direction of the algebras of functions. And that turns out to be actually the case also in differential geometry in the sense that the functor that sends a condition space to its, so that's just a set, maybe we should write this down, the, the, sorry, it's just an algebra, so C infinity of R, it's just a standard notation is for the set of smooth functions from this R and to, to our ground field, which is R, so R1 field. Right, this becomes an algebra by pointwise multiplication. <coughs> we, don't, we don't put any smooth structure on that algebra or anything, we just, it's just a plain R algebra, and as such, that functor is actually fully faithful. So that means that, this is much bigger, of course, but uh, as, long, as soon as you know that you're in the image, you can actually, and this will be important for our generalizations to so superform geometry, you can recognize everything you do on a Jesus space in terms of communified this. There's a, there's a, so this is just, sort of, I want to say there's a caveat here, but it's maybe not the wrong, not the right word. It's just, when people see this, sometimes they want to step in one direction that's just the wrong direction. Or you, that does not mislead you to think that you can think of the Cartesian spaces you know, as being defined schemes for these algebras in the usual sense. The reason is that when, when you do algebraic geometry, you don't just have this full subcategory. You take the full category here, the complete category, and then you compute your Cartesian products and fiber products in particular on the left as uh, tensor products on the right. And, and that works kind of by definition algebraic geometry because that completely fails here. The tensor products on the right will in general be far from the correct one. If you tensor the smooth algebras of um, on a Cartesian space with each other, they will fail by not being complete. There's more smooth functions on Rn1 plus 2 than there is in the tensor product in Rn1, Rn2. There's topology on this tensor product. The norm, if you're complete with respect to that, you get the rest. There's, there's, um, there's also other failures that you know, I discuss some. The um, so, so you just have to be aware that we're not actually doing algebraic geometry, but we do have this, this sort of little bit of a fact. And so we can use this now to enhance our category. So there's a little bit of notation on this slide now. Um, just look at it slowly, then, then it's okay. So we, we build a new category, which is larger than what we had before. So you see, we, we have this small subcategory here, and we're just making it a little bigger inside here. One, one consider the full thing, but that doesn't have good meaning for us, but we'll make it a little bit bigger. And we make it bigger, so the, the new objects, I'll well, denote them as Rn time, times Ds. So these, these Ds are generic symbols, there's not, not just one D, there's many Ds, these are the formal disks. And so what do I mean? So by this construction now, I actually define a full subcategory of community, well, wait, maybe that doesn't, maybe I don't quite say this, it's on the slide here. When we're finding a new full subcategory on commutative algebras, it's not a subcategory whose whose elements are, I call them this way, so this primitive notation, and here's the definition. It's those subalgebras that are the form in algebra smooth functions that we, that we just had. Tensor is an R algebra, so no fancy tensor program. Tensor is an R algebra with what uh, differential geometers call a veil algebra, what algebraic geometers call a complete R in algebra. But despite these terms, it's a very simple concept. It's just an algebra which has R, the multiples of the identity, and the rest is just a finitely, a finite dimensional Newtonian ideal. So it's a, it's a vector space, it's, it's a finite dimensional vector space, and if you apply the algebra product to, if you take a guy in there, then for every object in there, there's a natural number n, so the a to the n is zero. Could write this down if there's a request. Uh, so is this the square zero extension or not? Yes, well, no, it doesn't have to be square zero. Okay, because usually the, when you write this direct sum of a ring with the, with the module, so right. what's the question? Usually when you define this, this direct sum of a ring with, with a module over the ring, then this is the square zero thing. So this is different? Do you have relations? Yes, I'm not requiring, yeah, I'm not requiring it just to be a linear model. I'm, I'm, yeah, well, I mean, I'm just, 
So to take an example, it doesn't have to be first order, so that doesn't have to square to zero, but it has it's it has to it's n power for some n has to be zero. So this, the canonical examples are this: the um, the basic one, which is square zero, is the ring of dual numbers. We can take one way of writing it is, is this: we take the polynomial algebra of R in one generator. And then we, we mod out the ideal epsilon square. So, so that's another way. If, if you write it like this in this form, then this is r plus epsilon r, if you wish. <coughs> With the multiplication of the, these are multiples of the identity. There's an epsilon in there. You multiply and add as usual. As soon as, long, as soon as you get epsilon square, you say it's zero. This is what another horrible terminology, which is completely standard, is called the ring of dual numbers. Yeah, part of the trick of understanding these things from the literature is that you have to understand that all the words are meaningless and you have to kind of penetrate <laughs> looks through the matrix to see what's actually going on. Yeah. And, um, and the idea is so if you think of this as being if you think of this as being the, the smooth functions in that sense, kind of by, not by fiat, of, of a thing, then that thing, maybe in under cross both goes by this name here. It's the first order one-dimensional disk. That's what this notation means. First order, so one D first order infinitesimal disk. And the, the idea simply is so we in R. And we have our magic magnifying glass. If we look um, in, a, in a very small vicinity of zero, and we see here. These little epsilons, they're so tiny, you know, if you take a small number and square it, it becomes even smaller. But this is already so small that if you square it, it becomes just zero. So that's what we're enforcing here. And so it really means where, so this D1, 1, is an infinitesimal neighborhood of this point. But it's a first order infinitesimal neighborhood and it's allowed. And so this is a, this is a square zero extension, but we don't have to do this. We can also go to higher orders. We can say, let's only divide out the n plus first. Uh, power. And then, well, the picture is sort of the same, then this becomes a little big, bit bigger. Then it says epsilon is still pretty tiny. It doesn't have to vanish if you square it, maybe, but if you if you uh, multiply enough times with it, then it will vanish. So this would be called, I think in Cox book, this would be called vulgarity, but I think that is right. That's right. So these things are in here now, and you see, we think of them as, as infinite, so this. You should think of them as infinitesimally thick points. You can do this in a higher dimension, so it doesn't have to be this one dimensional line here. You can ask for this, this order n infinitesimal neighborhood of the origin in Rn. It's like it's the origin with a little halo around it of infinitesimal points. You see, we're just doing the most simple thing here. We take our original Rns, the ordinary finite smooth class that we already have, and we just say the stigma of it by taking the Dijon product of this. So this, this gives us space for the form. So the, 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 Imagery you have in mind for such a space is, is, a, is that it looks like an Rn here. And then you know we apply a magnifying glass, and then we see, and then we see that um, it's kind of thick into thickened like so. Right? Infinitesimal. So these things are there. So now I should ask, well, what's the homomorphism between them? And now we we go by this duality between algebra and geometry. We say, well, these algebras are functions which are completely determined the thing by an extension of Milner's exercise. So we just declare that a homomorphism from you know one such space to another is just dually an algebra homomorphism of the algebras, which actually we find them the other way around. That's of course that's the basic idea also of algebraic geometry. But we can do it again differential geometry too. And in fact, one powerful technical point here is that for these d's, these d's are actually essentially algebraic. So as long as you're just concerned with these infinitesimal thickenings, then many of the tools of algebraic geometry do apply. So that's formal Cartesian spaces, where formal means infinitesimally thickened. And yeah, we, we take our, uh, the covers, just the, the previous ones, that are kind of the identity. On the it sounds simplistic, but it turns out to be the right thing to do. 
and someone says that it's the infinitesimal extension is too small for there to be any notion of covered stuff. I don't know if, if you're onto it or not. Okay, so now we're gonna enhance one more. Remember that poly exclusion principle, which is the reason why you know things are solid here, so it's a very fundamental principle. And uh, we implement this now by saying, well, we have commutative algebras. Let's think of them as sitting in supercommutative algebras. Is that something I can just say? Should I say something about supercommutative algebras? <laughs> so supercommutative algebras is a zima two-graded algebra that is commutative in the zima two-graded sense. So should I write this down? Does anybody want me to see it? Yes, yes, please. Um, so supercommutative algebra. Over R for my purposes here is so first of all maybe a Z2 graded algebra. What does that mean? Let's put it right down here. So that means um, so it's an algebra. We have a decomposition as a direct sum of underlying vector spaces of a guy of an even part and an odd part. And Z2 graded means that as we multiply in the algebra. We, uh, we correspondingly add in, the, in this group. So, so the product goes A even. So if you have a guy in A even, another guy in A even, and the product lands in, in the even part. It's like an even element and an odd element, and the product is, is in the odd subspace. Which is not a sub algebra, but it's a module of the even part. Similarly, okay, let me write down odd odd a odd a even is it a odd. And one more, if both are odd by the by the rule of zero two, we get an even guy. So that's a that's a zero two graded algebra, and what we want to say is graded commutative. Second, such that for for any two homogeneous elements, so if, if A is in A sigma, where sigmas are the equal odd, and A prime is in A sigma prime, then so one says if they're homogeneously graded, right? They don't have to. There are some, but if they're homogeneously graded, then we say then we as we exchange exchange factors, we pick up sign. <coughs> so, so I'm, I'm using now. Yeah, so this is this is sigma times sigma prime. One of the product. <coughs> So we get a we get a minus sign. So this is equals plus one if either is even or equals minus one if both are odd. So that's the that's the only change we make. We have some algebras where some elements pick up a minus sign when you commute them past each other. Notice that this implies in particular is where the spotting student principle comes in, then implies in particular that um, that any odd guy squares to zero, which yeah, the long detour of concepts if, if then A is, a, is an observable for fermionic fields. That's the that implements the fact that you can't have two of them in the same spot because if you then you would have to multiply them. Okay, that's it. Can you maybe mention a small example? Oh yeah, sorry. Okay, no, Thanks. Yeah, I shouldn't stop here. Um, so the canonical example are the, are the super Cartesian spaces, of course. Let's see, what should I? Thanks for this. A class of examples, the super Cartesian spaces. Which, uh, which we want to make it right, like so. They have a dimension d. I don't want to don't write little n now to stick a bit to the physical thing. And then there's an n there. 
other than the natural numbers. So here, you hear the string theory sentence a lot. They say when uh, in d equals 6, n equals 1, supersymmetry or something. That's related to these two numbers. So is the thing, so that's the that's the superform card space, um, which is defined by the fact that undertaking um, smooth functions, which we don't actually take, we define them to be some supercommutative algebra, corresponds to the following supercommutative algebra. So, first of all, it's clear from the above that any ordinary commutative algebra becomes a supercommutative algebra just putting it in even degree, it's like this zero. In odd degree. That's, that's what I mean here. If I say, let's say the ordinary ring of uh, R algebra of ordinary smooth functions on R to the D, let me cancel this over R in the category of supercommutative algebras with, yeah, now it depends a bit on what, how you like to, to write this, with a Grassmann algebra on N generators. So one way of, one way of writing this is that we say we take Maybe to stick with the previous examples here, one way to say it is to take the polynomial algebra. So traditionally they're called theta now, of generators theta, theta to the alpha, where alpha is an index that goes from one to n. So this just means the polynomial algebra. And then we want out the ideal that just enforces this relation. So we take them in degree odd. We have to do, since we're building a supercommutative algebra, if I say generator, I have to say in which degree is it? So it's odd, and then, and then, uh, well, if I say this way, actually, then I'm done. Then, then uh, that's what it is. Because then, so this implies now that right, theta alpha, theta beta equals minus theta beta, theta alpha, is they odd? And otherwise, you can multiply them by smooth functions. So any guy in here is now uh, a sum of smooth functions that are kind of indexed by powers of thetas, where it stops at dimension n. You can at most multiply n thetas without getting to zero, because as soon as two are the same, they vanish. So that's super space. In physics literature, that's called super space. And despite that super terminology, but, but actually even if you Anyway, despite the terminology, notice that these are not restricted to some hypothesis on supersymmetry. Our phase space, the one we inhabit, the one that models our existence here, is a superspace. Therefore, <laughs> supersymmetry just means that, that actually the, the natural supergroup makes sense. Anyway, okay. Uh, should we expect D and N to be the same? They should, they, no, not at all. They're, they're closely related as we. Well, that's where the supersymmetry comes in. So next we want to ask, should I answer this now? Okay, just very quickly. So, so, so how do we model space-time in modern geometry? We do it by, by Cartan geometry by saying the actual space-time, say R3,1 that we have it, what is it actually in terms of Cartan geometry? One says it's actually the, um, the the Fokker Ray group, a group of isometries of Minkowski space. I'll be quick now, right? Because this lets us, leads us a bit astray. I don't want to fully explain this. Maybe. So, this is the Fokker Ray group. This is what the Ansel started some years back, almost 100 years back, basically. Now, a little bit more. Right? So, quotient by. Um, the Lorentz group of rotations that fix a point, Lorentz group. This is the point group of yours. And, and now we can ask to superify this by starting here. So that's a super group. And we turn this into the super Pompare group. There's constraints here. As you, since there's this group structure around, if you want to take the from very group and make it a super a group object in super spaces. You see that there's constraints on the relation between the dimensions here and the number of what guys. So this gives constraints. And then we, we call it out by the spin group. Spin 
Yes, so I have n here in my measure device, so we can do this in any dimension n, n. And this quotient is then Sivankovsky space time, and it's denoted R. D comma one or n comma one slash, and then there's a bolt. This is a this is a, a very clever notational trick. A bolt trace n, which is actually saying that you have n of these thetas and they transform in a spin represent in a real spin representation. They also look the same. So this is now a real spin representation. And, and, and not and, and there's constraints like which will you know. So that's what constraints. Are. And that's a different talk, and I'm running out of time here. But let's continue. Okay, so here's our. Uh, so we, I think we have some rough understanding of what superformal Cartesian spaces are. So I gave this example where uh, we had the odd graded infinitesimals. These are particular infinitesimals. That's important. Everything that is super geometric is actually also infinitesimal. But in addition, we allow ourselves to have um, to have even graded infinitesimals as we did before. Oh, here's the example. Uh -huh. Great. So, right. so this example is the same. So, so these sides are related to each other by a sequence of adjunctions. And that's where the story starts with the modalities. So let me start with the trivial ones here. So since Cartesian space is a dominant object, R0, the point, um, the point region <coughs> that sends the point to the point is a right adjoint. So there's a left adjoint. The left adjoint is just a thing. <laughs> it feels a bit silly. But it's true, right? So, so we have this adjunction here, and even though it's silly, it's the it's already contains it, the seed of something very important, which we also saw in Mike's talk already a bit. So it says that there's some operation here, which I might pi for some of the field, but the shape comes in later. So, um, so that factor takes a Cartesian space and contracts it to a point. It's witnessing the fact that even though the Cartesian space is not trivial geometry, that's how we set it up. It's not it's not equal to the point. But if you are a homotopy theorist and you're faced with like a Cartesian space, you don't see anything but a point. It's funny how the, the word space has evolved, right? For most time of mankind, space meant R3. <laughs> now homotopy theorists, when they say space, uh, film R3, they think of a point. So there's something, you see, there's some information that we've lost on the way, and that's exactly the information we have to recover. <laughs> so this is a reflective inclusion. This is interesting here. So there's this evident inclusion of Cartesian space into formal Cartesian spaces just by regarding them with. Uh, Trivial, no infinitesimal thickening. And that inclusion, as a little reflection shows, and we don't want to do this on the board now, uh, so that exercise, that is co reflective. That is a right adjoint. Part of, well, I show one example, one, one fact of this. It says the curious. <laughs> 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 it says the curious consequence that if you, have, uh -huh, that if you take an ordinary Cartesian, an ordinary finite space, and hold it into one of these. Discs, these infinitesimal disks, then, um, then they all factor through the point. Right? This is in the inclusion, in the left inclusion. You can throw it over and reduce this away. That you, can't, you can't see the infinitesimal thickening with an ordinary space. Dually, this is just the fact that dually, we have to write this as an algebra homomorphism. There's infinitesimal elements in here. By algebra homomorphism, an infinitesimal element has to go to an infinitesimal element. The only infinitesimal element is zero here. Which is the one that comes from the point. So the only interesting maps are the other way around, which gives us to actually 90% of everything that infinitesimals do for us just comes from the fact that it's a co-reflective, that the non-infinitesimal things are co-reflective in the infinitesimal space. That's that goes a long way in kind of what I'm trying to show next is, is the proof of how that goes a long way. Because just having this co-reflection there, so one step higher, well, you know. Will be crude part of the system of junctions. And, um, and then there's an interesting part. So, of course, Cartesian spaces, with my point? Cartesian spaces are, since you know, it's at least plausible, easy to check, the superformal Cartesian spaces are, are derived here. They were just defined just as the formal Cartesian spaces, just allowing the infinitesimals to be outgraded. So, the, these arguments just go through straight away. So, we actually can consider this full include here Cartesian space all the way into superformal Cartesian spaces, trivial superformal that is thickening. And it's again co reflective. The very interesting thing is that this second inclusion here is also reflective. It's a little exercise again, I won't do it on the board, unless you force me to again. But it's a simple exercise. You just write it down to see that the left adjoint is the one that on algebras 
it takes just an algebra to its, to its even subalgebra. Whereas the right adjoint portions are the ideal generated by the odd module. So that's a curious thing that, that is trivial, you know, it's, it's a student exercise to see, but it's not highlighted in the literature, and I think it's super important. Yeah, we see, we see what it does for us. So that's, that's just completely basic and elementary here, right? Every beginning uh, student or anything can do this. Oh, yeah, describe it. My slides are better, actually, than I remember. <laughs> okay, so now what we want to do is we want to, we want to pass to the corresponding top bosses. Um, so we form chief top bosses, and in fact, yeah, because here I can just easily say infinity chief top bosses, and we want to play. So we take the chief infinity top bosses in Cartesian spaces, form a Cartesian space, and so forth, and we want to think of them in the sense of goal top bosses as being infinity group bosses that are equipped with extra geometric structure, very much or completely in the sense of both these picture of frontal geometry. You know, there's this interesting article from the early 60s, or even before, I think maybe 58 or something, We kind of says, look guys, we, we, we did algebraic geometry now via locally ring toposes. Let me tell you that that's not uh, the right way to do it. There's a better way to, we should think of the schemes, well, they should be sorted in some sort. So you all know this. We should think of them as just being sheaves on the side of the field, uh, a fine space that could be some construction. And that's the point of view where we're just taking here. So a guy in here is just, uh, just a space that knows how to map Cartesian spaces into it smoothly. And so, okay, so we can form these. Remember, this is just a junction of sides that we just said. And now by card extension, so if I let, I'm, I'm displaying the left card extension here for a second. By left card extension, each of these functors becomes a functor between, well, first of all, the pre-sheaf toposes. You just have to work a little bit to see that it actually descends to the sheaf toposes here. The only point to check anything is here because that we had a not trivial topology here in the, in the R end of actions, whereas these topologies were all trivial. So that's easy to see. It's a tiny check here. So we get these, but but now the thing is, I'm not sure if I should write this to the board, tell me. So for every morphism of, uh, for every functor of categories, so you pass to pre-sheaves, you have, of course get a new joint triple of functors on the corresponding pre-sheaf categories, by left, right, kind extension, and by pullback. So that's just the left kind extensions. Each of these functors has a further right adjoint given by pullback along the corresponding functor, and then has a further right adjoint given by right kind extension. And the uniqueness of adjoints these, these glue here, so the, the, the extra right adjoint of this guy happens to be that guy, because they've already joined. So that means we end up, let's see if my slides are here. Ah, here comes something, look. <laughs> <laughs> that took me a while, that's fine, all right. <laughs> 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 it's like 1,000 lines of code to this <laughs> <laughs> I'm just copy pasting it. Anyway, so. <laughs> so you see, these are by, by pullback and by right adjoints, we get these four further adjuncts. So there's quite a system of adjunctions here. And, um, and so let's organize this somehow. I'm gonna, so what I want to show now is, so that's a system of adjoint factors, the factor, you know, they keep kind of increasing here. So you see, one thing that happens here, it's not so, it's not so much highlighted here, but with this one, it's important. So, so this guy itself, so superformal Cartesian spaces themselves, are also cohesive over the base point. So that for them, I didn't quite show this, but maybe I should show it. I just to see that. <laughs> so, so you actually have this kind of a junction, also all the way here, and all the way from here to there. So there's actually a disk from there all the way to there. Here's it again. And, and so that's, that's where we get one more right adjoint here. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now, I want to, it's kind of obvious, but it's still a bit tricky and, and maybe good to see. I want to give you an animation that shows how such a system, system of adjunctions gives the system of modality. So what we're going to do now is, right, you know that you know it works, so we have two categories. And we have a, we're in the functor. So star, three, or whatever you call it. And then, and then here from the star. So for any, so a junction, you get the corresponding monads and co-monads on C and D are going back and forth. So there's, there's the corresponding guy here. So we go down with P shriek to D and then back with P star up. So it's very relevant you now. So this gives us an inner functor from C to C, which we call maybe box or circle. And so what I, what I do now is I, I pair all these pairs here and see. So 
Remember H, my standard abbreviation for the topos I'm in. So, um, so this is infinity sheaves and super form of Cartesian space. This is super homotopy theory. And so first of all, I go all the way down to just a point here. She doesn't have to say it. That's the terminal functor. I, I want to start from the bottom just for fun. So the, the, just the terminal functor. Um, and uh, and it, has a, it has a left adjoint by the fact that we're in a topos. It has an initial object, so I can include the initial object. Yeah, so that's one step I didn't have. Didn't show the slides, but anyway, it's clear that this exists. And so, what it, you can for, look at this operation that takes any object here, sends it down here, then it just becomes a unique thing, and we embed it as the initial object. So I call this modality empty, nothing, or nothing. Actually, it sends everything to nothing. And, and since we have also a terminal object in top of this functor that sends everything to the point, what says the right adjoint, sending everything to the the terminal object, and they're adjoined to each other. Okay, that's the triviality, but you'll see maybe it, it, it completes the picture, that's why I'm sure. Now, we kind of factor it through. Do you want to explain why you call it pure being, or do you want to just- No, I don't, want to, I don't want to explain it. <laughs> <laughs> it's the asymptotic part. Okay. It's a mystery. It's a mystery, yeah, it's for you to solve it. <laughs> So, so geometrically, I think I had it on the previous slide. So, so this funny notation, maybe I should, I should say this here. So this, so this is really our base topos. So H flat just means the flat model guys. We got it. So this is just our base topos. That's the, the plain infinity group points, which you should think of as being geometrically discrete. Like you can have a group, you can ask, is it a knee group, is it a topological group, is it a discrete group? So these are the, disc the discrete groups that live in here. And I call it H flat just to highlight that we get them all from the. Yeah, that's what it says, geometric. All right, and now, so we have the terminal geometric morphism, our gamma, the global section morphism, which, since, since our study had a terminal object, it's just a variation of the terminal object. So it sends a geometrically uh, enriched uh, or infinite group of its geometric structure, a super formal structure, to just an analyze set of points. There is a left adjoint, just it's just an autobus theory actually. The locally constant uh, sheaf functor, as you would say if you had a petit topos, but here we think of it as including the geometric discrete objects as the discrete objects. So that adjunction, yeah, that is the flat that was that, that in this model, this is the flat operation that Michael was talking about in this uh, circuit. And, and now well, this exists in every topos, so you wouldn't want to call it maybe flat in every topos, but the adjunction exists. But now the thing is, uh, so this is all the, also for the right adjoint that came from, that was this CODIS thing that came from the previous slide. So that means there's another modality here by going down this way and then going back with this function instead of this one. They adjoint each other, that's the sharp. We've also heard about this. So we keep going. Next, this is for the last adjoint here, pi. So going down with pi. Fundamental infinity group going back of discrete. That's ash shape. It's really an ash shape. I hope it is. <laughs> <laughs> it took me some time. <laughs> but I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Just, I don't know, at least on my computer, the package, IPA package has a bug. I need to close this in my inbox or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we factor again. You see, it keeps going. We, we, we fill up this, you know, we had these stages of intermediate. Things. This was the point. I've got the partition uh, uh, spaces so the, and so forth. Well, you, you get the pattern, right? So we, we get another, we can factor through here. So that means now we can go, go down with pi, not all the way. We don't contract, completely contract our superformal partition <laughs> space. We just contract the infinitesimal thickening away. When we get a, what's called an advert geometry, a reduced thing, it, it's no longer infinitesimally thickened. We haven't shrunk the full thing, just the infinitesimal part of it. We can still go back discreetly with this delta. This gives us this E model. So that's, so that's, that's the model operator that Felix wrote a thesis and an article about, showing it, it just assuming this was kind of its interpretation as being that guy instead of some other guy. Um, gives you a whole lot of um, fairly non trivial differential geometry. Sorry, can I just ask what the, what the carrot means? The oh, yeah, sorry. So, right, I should have said this. So that means the, that means the <laughs> model objects here. Is, are included in the modal objects here. The, the so you, yeah, you use the same symbol for like the modal, because some of them are co-modalities, right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. 
Okay, so the modal objects are contained in the modal objects and the co-modal objects are contained in the co-modal objects? Well, either, because those, oh, those okay. are that are in the vertical column are all modalities or all co-modalities. Okay. You see, because we but start here, this modality, so it's modality, co-modality, modality. Yeah, co-modality, sorry. Yeah. Okay, and you use the same symbol. Yeah. So, logically, it always makes sense to ask are the full subcategories that are defined by them, are they included in each other? Yeah. Right? And, and that's what I mean, exactly. So you see how this comes about? Yeah, look at you say it. So, so this guy, it's more the objects for those that were the image of this long functor here, right? Yeah. But these are now those in the image of just this factorization. So in this, in this sense, yeah, that's actually what I wanted to show. In this sense, you can see how the stuff that appears further to the left here, in the junction system starts up appearing further on top there. Oh yeah, so what's that symbol? This symbol? Yeah. That, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Paraphrasing and Peter Mayer, I right? spend most of the time just thinking about your symbols here. So let's, let me start from the next one. So, so we keep going one further. So there's this R. So, why is R? so R is reduced. So it turns out this guy that's called R there is the thing that in algebraic geometry is called reduction. That's why it's an R, right? Real reduction. And so this is just the thing that takes a super formal space, so something like this, where this is some super infinitesimal point. It's simply Simply shrinks away the infinitesimal fit. And so I needed a word for that, a joint of that. You have a, sorry. Oh, not in, yes. So, M is just because it's dual to remove. But also, it's a bit, you know, you, know, you need to come up with a symbol. There's no perfect symbol. I stands for infinitesimal. Yeah, I, that, that would be a good, that, yeah, one should say that. But somehow, of course, all of them are about it, yeah. But yeah, right. That's important. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that doesn't come out the way it should. That's that's supposed to be, you know, the ampersand. I can't do this. In like, I'm not good at not in time setting, but the ampersand comes from at, right? And so this is the map that has to do with, with forming forming etal maps, formally etal maps. <laughs> 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 you know, okay. Yeah. Just join the debate on the informal. <laughs> And this ampersand is not good. It should, it should come out. In principle, it should be positive. If that helps, I don't know. But these are very good. I'm very fond of these symbols. So here's another one. So, um, so now we, so this, remember, this was super formal Cartesian space, and this just formal Cartesian space. Uh, okay, but let me be finished. So there's this inclusion here, um, which which you you know it has there's no odd graded guys but after you include here you you um, you're, you're picking the trivial super thickening. So the guys in this inclusion are the bosonic spaces. And this modality here sets everything down. It forgets the super part and then reembeds the underlying bosonic part. So that's the bosonic modality. You see if in physics you write a Feynman diagram of bosons, I can buy wiggly lines. Experimenting with my straight lines, and that's why the even part, see that the other adjunction, it takes a superformal Cartesian space, it doesn't forget the fermions, but it pairs them to an even thing. So it, it takes the even subalgebra, so it takes a subalgebra where the thetas only apply uh, appear in even powers, which gives a, a bosonic infinitesimally thickened space, and these are pairs, so that's the double straight. This is the fermionic modality, bosonic. Um, um, that's a super important one, actually. That's real nomic, but I won't talk about this today. This is, this is important for doing super that. Actually, no, let me say this, because this is something actually only modal people can actually understand, I think, maybe. So, but the thing is, should I say this? How many, how many minutes do I have? Yeah, I don't know, 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Let me just say it very briefly. It's just a story. I won't draw it to the board. So when you do super gravity, it's either you're doing an ordinary Manifolds, space and manifolds, and then it's super complicated. <laughs> it's just it's just a mess, a pain. Or you do it elegantly. You say no, we're category theorists. We just work internally to super space all the time. So let's make our space time a super space time on one, one of these super Minkowski space times, and then you just do ordinary gravity in general to this super. Thing. In particular, then you have just ordinary diffeomorphisms in general to the super topos, and they now decompose into those diffeomorphisms that are just kind of diffeomorphisms of the ordinary underlying space, and those that involve the fermions. And those that involve the fermions are just the supersymmetry transformations. So then everything becomes very, very elegant. You can have a chance of actually understanding what you're doing. 
The trouble is, after you've done, after the, the dust has settled, you're left with the super space time, which is not what you want. On the super space time, every field is an expansion in, in the thetas, where, you know, in, in, in class cases, so there's 32 of these thetas. So you have many, many more fields than you think you should have. It should really be just one graviton, but now there's 32 components. Of it. So what's really happening is that we want to say, actually, after imposing equations of motion, the modular space of fields on my super space time should be fixed by its value on the bosonic part. Now you see, this is a modal statement. So this was the the Italian group of theorists called the Rionomy constraint. They wrote a whole textbook I'm doing short gravity just to do this constraint. But it says the following: This is the modular space of fields. Then, then, and you have a super space time. Then the maps into there are supposed to be fixed. They're determined by the re by their restrictions to the bosonic part. Space of these maps that yeah, is exactly right. Is supposed to be equivalent to maps from the bosonic modal part. Or precomposition. That's real. I mean. Something I can actually check for super gravity equations of motion. You can see it's exactly the statement that uh, the slow modular space of fields should be rheonomic. It should be an image of, of Ru, which is exactly the statement. Yeah, so that's something. And then, yeah, just for fun, okay, so this stops it. Just for fun, observe that, of course, there's also a the trivial junction between the net functor. Whose full subcategory is, is the complete topos, so that's kind of saying this was these minimal subpieces, and we, we stratified everything uh, by these subcategories in our case. So that's so that's a system of modalities that one finds in the model of So in the model of super homotopy theory. And now, right, what I've been doing about, a lot about the last years, with some help from people like Felix and others, that I so it's clear in applications, you can phrase many things in terms of these modalities, many things you want to do in actual applications with regard to geometry. The question is now, how much of this can I maybe do entirely in terms of you know, how, how much can I actually forget my model and just work with these modalities? And this is um, ongoing work, so I can't claim that I can reconstruct full level of super gravity or something from just these modalities, but it's getting close. I can maybe, no, I can't, I can show something in that. But, but that's something I just want to advertise as being worth exploring. Such a system of modalities must be, must be something important. So we've played a lot with these here, for instance, we know that if you just take these two here, if you have them on an infinite topos, it means you have a good um, theory of differential cohomology in this topos, which is always something. Then what Felix really showed is, and you see this, if you have these two here, then you have a good theory of, um, of actual differential geometry. So this, is a bit, this layer is a bit like differential topology. This layer is like differential geometry and this like super geometry. <clears throat> yeah, I just showed I just showed that some neat stuff goes on here and uh, this will be about the normal. But oh yeah, so that's what we have. So okay. Oh yeah, I want to point out something that, that was briefly also mentioned in Mike's talk. Uh, turns out in that model, um, those guys in the middle here are special in that they're all motivic in the in the sense that they are one localizations. It just so happens in this model. Namely this shape is really just a localization in the sense of motivic homotopy theory, as we saw in, in Peter's talk. Oh, there you are. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, and R1, right, that's something we sort of mentioned. But also, well, the next guy is a bit solid, let me ignore this. But this guy, Rionomy, is localization at the super point, or zero one, so the one goes over the point. That's kind of, it's kind of neat, maybe, if you want to, if you want to formalize all this in type theory, maybe you want to add this as, as axioms, and, some version as Mike did in, in real cohesion or something. You want to say, let's assume I have a system of modalities and such that there is a representing object in the sense. Uh, because the super, the super point is super important. Right? We somehow, if we do this, we kind of get this progression. It goes from, from really nothing, but it kind of discovers the super point. And, um, and that turns out to be important. If you just look at the kind of the equivalent y theta of the super point, 
um, one finds a lot of structure that, that people want to see this few things. I won't talk about this here. But there's really a lot of structure that comes out just of this report. Maybe what I do want to show in the last five minutes, I, I said something about equivariance here. So what we really need in applications of physics, is if we well, do the string theories, we don't need smooth space times, we need only folded space times. Maybe we can just very briefly show this. So there's one more set of modalities actually we want to maybe for the application add to this. Um, so what's an omnifold? Yeah, I don't know. I, don't, I, don't, I have just five minutes left, so let me just show something. So, so, to, so Charles Rask in 2014 observed that it's called the global equivalent motivating theory is, is cohesive. The proof of that is, is an evidence, so that it's easy to, to see this. It's, it's harder to see what it, what it means, what it implies. And for a long time, we were puzzled by some informal discussions on how to actually think about the modalities of that cohesion. And then it, at some point, recently it all became clear to me. And it's really this here. So all before this to be some space, that is, as you know, maybe, or otherwise you, you know, learn, which is supposed to have singularities, have, have places where it's not really smooth, but where it looks like the fixed point of a finite group action on that space. And it's curious, actually, that people have been understanding how to really think about this. If you ask a physicist how to think about this, you'll never, you will always say, yeah, it's a space. So this is the actual quotient of such an action. This is the, the famous teardrop uh, or before. We take the hammer spheres and you act on them with some uh, finite subgroups of the rotations, uh, introducing a deficit angle, and it just makes the points that are fixed by the action be cones. And you can have it on both sides. So, so the way physicists think of this, and all before this really is this, it's actual space, and it's some smooth theory, it's just not smooth there, but it has that point. And then, as mathematicians tried to develop what is the concept of orbifolds really informally, there was kind of a big breakthrough at some point when Red Prong and Ikemodek and maybe others said, no, actually the right way to think of it is that it's as a smooth group point. We should think of it as it to be the stacky homotopy quotient of, say, some manifold x by that group G. Like this is a picture like so, the labeling is not quite accurate. You should write, instead of S1, you should think of it as a finite subgroup of S1. But anyway, then you, have, you see the sphere, it's, it's still a round smooth sphere, it's just that these two fixed points here now have um, group point isotropy groups. But as a group point, it's a smooth thing, whereas it's not smooth. And so as a motivation, it really means maybe, you know, maybe, so these are kind of two opposite pictures, and maybe the overflow singularity is really supposed to be both of them, not either. Because we don't want to throw away all the insights we got from thinking of overflow as group points, but it's also clear that it misses something. In particular, it means the overflow cohomology of these guys is not the correct equivalent green cohomology, which is another story. But anyway, so, so this is good, but this is also good. So maybe we should unify them to and say, no, we're floating there, these are two extreme aspects. It should be something that we maybe want to call blackboard goal phase BG, calling chance notation here. And it should have these two aspects. It should have the, the actual fixed point here, which means we just actually send it to the point or we send it to the group. And then it's realized as follows, and then I'm done. So we can introduce another uh, site that I uh, would like to advertise as being called singularities. It's supposed to be. The Cartesian space was our local model space for space and normal says for space and kind of singularities, let's throw in local models for these. Well, it should just be these BGs, so just one object group points. And so we think of this as being the full subcategory of uh, all group points, all infinite group points on those that look for BG for final G. And we think of it as a site in the single <coughs> sense. So this is usually called the global orbit category. That's one of these words. Well, the slices of it are the actual orbit categories where the word makes sense. But actually, I found, it, found things fell into place when you call it this way. But anyway, in the literature, this is a local orbit category. And now, just because, just because it's a site with a terminal object, even though it's now a 2 one side, I think so, there's trivially an adjoint quadruple of functors, because we can again include that terminal object, have an adjoint between the point that the similarities can, can't extend. And since our um, coverings were trivial anyway, there's nothing to prove. So this trivial consequence to get this adjoint quadruple. And, and so, so I'm showing here now the full thing. So here was our stratification by the super geometry, right? This was super formal spaces, formal spaces, spaces. But now we, we consider everything you see, we consider the full shift of infinity on singularities with values in, in H. So that's in total, that's now infinity shifts on the product side of the super formal Cartesian spaces of singularities, which is exactly what it should be, right? It just says we're looking at spaces that are locally modeled by. They look like a similarity times this 
And so, so we have these four factors here, which were the ones that are not labeled, unfortunately, from the previous slide, coming from the cohesion of the singularity side. And as you go through this, this says the following interpretation. This produces the smooth and thin, the smooth stacky group part, the singular quotient part, and, and the rider joint is actually super important. It takes, it turns out this takes a Lie group part, and turns it, and thinks of its isotropic groups as being only full singularities. Anyway, so we get actually this system of injunctions. And then we can keep going. And then Felix Thesis comes in, and now let's be what I say tomorrow. Um, then we can start saying, what well, is a super orbifold, fully synthetic? So yeah, it's hard to read, but it just says it's an object. And then I, I put conditions that say it's modal with respect to a bunch of these modalities. And the gives the gifts quite a bit of okay, this stuff. Uh, maybe I'll stop here. Yeah, I'll stop Okay, thanks. Thank you. All. Questions? Yes. So uh, I, I only heard about uh, sort of these smooth stacks and smooth group weights uh, probably two months ago, and uh, what I had heard was that for the sort of classical or before picture, the problem was that people didn't know what the morphisms should be, but there were a bunch of proposals for what the morphisms were. So how does this work when you reintroduce these uh, this other picture? Yeah, I'm claiming this this correct picture, but in fact, since um, so I'm claiming the way to do it is the orbifold. I'm claiming the orbifolds are precisely as, as a slide I want to show. Is uh, orbifold is the uh, is the the code is the, the singularity orbifold code is create manifolds inside our infinity torus. That turns out I have the right brain cohomology, but also since this is actually a fully faithful inclusion, it means. That the category of orbifolds in this sense is equivalent to the prompt border category of orbifolds regarded as smooth group points. Mm. So I'm, I'm kind of claiming that is as a category the right thing, but if you want to regard the orbifold as a smooth stack, if you wish, right? Geometric stack. That's the right category, but if you want to compute the cohomology of that orbifold, which, which is something you want to do, because the fields in, in physics are, are going to be co cycles with the cohomology theory on this orbifold space time. Then you should not consider the cosecants in the category of smooth infinity group points. Mm -hmm. You should hit that orbifold with, with this thing that is just unpronounceable now, but looks very good. It's, we should orbifold it. You should say, wherever my group point has isotopic groups, I replace them with these, you know, I, I replace the groupoidal BGs with these new BGs, declaring that it's now a singularity. And then you compute the cohort. That's the picture that appears here. Mm -hmm. But it's right, there was this debate. And it was it was a sign that something about the nature of orbifolds was actually mysterious. I should say that this this um, this idea that it should be global equivalent homotopy theory that should make sense of orbifold cohomology is something that was advertised just very recently by Stefan Schwede in his, in his big book on global homotopy theory. He has in the introduction he has a motivation page where he says why do we do global equivalent homotopy theory? And he says oh you know what it's it's going to be the right cohomology theory for orbifolds. It doesn't quite expand on that, but that's what. Let me see the light. Our questions? Yes. So when you do uh, super geometry, uh, imagine that you could first change your base from infinity group points to Z2 infinity group points, and then do or, or Z2 sense, yeah, do Z2 sense, and then do algebra in there. Is there a is there a reason to go this path instead of, say, changing your notion of set to a super set first? And then... Oh, yeah, I see. You want to bring in the Zemo 2 grading by looking at Zemo 2 equivalent one of it. No, that's not the same thing. It, yeah, no, that's just, yeah, I, I see where you're, where you're coming from, but, but no, that's just not how it works. But not every, you know, I think there's a coincidence of low degrees. Z, Zemo 2 just appears in many places in different roles, it's just not the same role. So, but we can, I mean, just to amplify, so this category of similarities that I introduced, which is really it's in global orbit category, it has the, it's called the global orbit category because if you take any of these BGs, if you take any finite group, which might be, might be Z12, then it's actually equivalent to the actual orbit category. 
you want to or whatever. Um, the continuity field, the categories, these objects are transitive orbits. Yeah, so that's right, G. And, um, and if you want to do if you want to do G infinity group points, so G equivalent mod the theory, then it just pre shifts on this. And we so this is this is G space distribution. Modular G equivalent mod. But we just implemented this. This is actually so you can you can look at Z equivalent infinity group points in this context. It's just that these two Z mod twos are not the same, right? So we cannot take our H, which was which was remember it was infinity sheaves just as here on, on singularities with various with various in the smooth super infinity group but and slice that over over BG. Then by usual <coughs> by usual effect you can take the slice in here and this becomes the orbit category and then we have G equivalent Super multiple theory for fixed G. You take it to the Z mod 2. And that's important for many applications. It's not the same Z mod 2s. Yes? Yeah. So, yeah. and probably you've already answered it, but I, I didn't get it. So, I, I understand that I, I would have thought that all defaults can be viewed as higher, uh, uh, higher sheaves on Cartesian spaces. Um, and but now you're reintroducing re them again and in building a new site somehow, even though you already have higher sheets in heavy space. Yeah. So, yeah, sorry, I just tried to say exactly that before, but it was going a bit quick. I can see that. Okay. If you have a minute, let me just say it again. Yes, so in fact, you're right. That's, that's what I just said to Harry. We, we, we can start with our smooth group points. Thought of as orbifolds. So we have now we have the subscript here for smooth. So this is sort of non-singular fluid, non orbital So non-singular smooth or super uh, smooth form it doesn't matter, infinity group points. Particularly if you have a if you have a smooth manifold. And, and so this is the, the top loss of sheaves on. Yes, this is, yeah, so this is, this is sheaves yeah. on, you know, not on our card space. Yeah. Yes. And if you think that we have a smooth manifold, yeah. And a Lie group acting smoothly, you can form the, the homotopy quotient in here yeah. and get the action Lie group point as usual. Yeah. And in what I prompt theory would say, that's what all before. Yeah. And I'm saying, so the category of these is in fact the right category, but this is not the orbifold as you should use it. If you want to do things that you want to do with orbifolds, some things come out wrong if you use this. So it's sort of like when you're trying to compute cohomology or something, you go into chain complexes first, even though you only care about the, the group or something. Like you, you take the cohomology with a bigger category or Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's one way of thinking of it. So so we have now this inclusion here. This was this is actually this code disk or sharp thing, you know, before we go down to the file or to to the full edge. So this is now sheaves infinity. So here now I allow it's a motivic kind of thing because I'm, I already have the BGs in here. Mm -hmm. If you do this for the point, so this is this um what I can do. So that's both. Gold BG. It's already in here, a smooth group point. Mm -hmm. But now, as we go, as we go to this new side, so I'm claiming you should really do this. You take this this scale of singularities. And remember, its objects were BGs. They were also grouped by their, a group is assumed to be if a group is assumed to be finite, it should be mm -hmm. They look very much the same, but there's now a second copy of each of these group points. So it's like a motivic thing, like we don't have two spheres, we have two different BGs for every finite group. This is smooth BG. So you're taking the product of the original side with the side with, with this new side. side. Yeah, introducing new generators BG. I see. Yeah. Well, I'm doing this is good work. This is the process of global yeah. homotopy theory. I'm just I'm just explaining if you want to dash for orbifolds. So there's a new instance now of BG, and by this picture that that I used to motivate this, I'm claiming that you should think of this as being the actual orbifold singularity, which has these two projections. It, it knows that it has a non-singular quotient and a smooth quotient. So it maps to this. 
but it's kind of more. And now, as we as we move this over here, you can work out the cotest of this cotest mod of BG is BG. So this functor that it re that embeds our smooth differential group points into here co-discreetly in the orbifold descent. That produces the orbifolds in the sense that I'm claiming is the right incarnation. But this functor is fully faithful, so as far as the category is concerned, you don't change it. But as Harry just said, in here we have now other coefficient objects mm -hmm. that we can use to map into all of these things. And it turns out that's what we need to get actually green nectar and commodity. Well, you know, we run the theory, the commodity theory on an orbifold, that if my orbifold is presented as a global quotient, it reduces to the Breeden equivalent, G equivalent commodity of that thing. And that turns out to be right here. It doesn't turn out to be right here. Here's some, here's some smooth version of Borel equivalent commodity. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, we have one minute break. Yep. Sounds good.